This morning we're talking about heaven. Heaven. We are going to heaven. So, the inspiration for this lesson came from two things. Two people. Uh, actually, twofold. Jake's video series he's been showing on Wednesday night uh, from Bill Watkins, uh, which has been absolutely wonderful. And if you haven't seen those, you've really missed some good preaching. This guy, Bill Watkins, knows how to preach. A lot more than I do. Anyway, in which he mentioned the Apostle Paul. Paul lived as a Hebrew among Hebrew, a Pharisee among Pharisees. He was a persecutor of the church, as many of us know. But then he had a come-to-Jesus moment on the road to, the, to, to Damascus. And when that happened, uh, God got his attention, and God corrected his vision for him. And he suffered it. He, he was com converted. And he, he, they preached the gospel to him. Ananias preached the gospel to him. And he was <coughs> baptized into Christ. And then he went from persecutor of the church to being persecuted as the church. And he began to preach the gospel. And he lived his life for the Lord. He suffered terribly for living for Jesus. Just read 2 Corinthians 11, 22-33. But as you read about his life in the scriptures and all that he suffered for Christ, he is not complaining, <coughs> not at all. He's just telling us what happened. But as you read about it, you realize... Rather than complaining, he's describing his life as he lived it, knowing that he was going to heaven in the end. He was convinced that he was going to heaven. And he lived the rest of his life like he was going to heaven. Amen. And that's what we're going to talk about today. In Philippians chapter 3, verses 12 and following, we read about Paul describing his life after his conversion. Pressing forward to that which is before me. I lay a hold, press forward to lay hold of that prize that awaits for me in heaven. I'm a citizen of the kingdom of heaven, he says in Philippians. He was going to heaven. In 2 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 8, near the end of his life, he said, A crown of life awaits me, and not to me only, but to all of those who have uh, who welcomed the Lord's appearing. He lived his life for the Lord because he realized he was going to heaven. And then two weeks ago on a Sunday evening, Tom over here did an excellent, excellent devotional on Psalm 23. And the last verse in that psalm, uh, verse 6, is what um, inspired me and gave me the motivation to put these two things together. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Think about David and his life. He realized that he was going to heaven, and he lived his life that way. Now, those of you in the ladies' Bible class say, wait a minute, Jim. Wait a minute. He did a lot of bad things, and he did. But the key is he repented. I don't know about you, but I've done some bad things. I've sinned too. And I've repented. You've repented. You've done bad things. It's not going to hinder me from living my life knowing that I'm going to heaven because my Savior and Lord, my shepherd, is Jesus Christ. Amen. So, are we going to heaven? Well, the answer overwhelmingly is yes, we're going to heaven. So, let's live our lives like we are going to heaven. Amen. What does that look like? What does a life of a person who is going to heaven look like? Well, it should look like your life. It should look like my life. So what should our lives look like? Live like we're going to heaven. Well, number one, we need to worship God like we're going to heaven. Worship God like we're going to heaven. What does that mean? Sing like you're going to heaven. Sing like it. Sometimes our singing could, you know, sound more like a funeral dirge than anything. 
It doesn't sound like we're going to heaven. It sounds like we're going out to the cemetery out of Plainsburg to plant somebody. <laughs> that's not what we're all about. We need to sing like we're going to heaven. I love it when Tim leads singing. Did you see him this morning? That's what I dedicated my life to. And he held his hand right up to his heart. Passion. Passion from the heart in our singing. Appreciating the words that we are singing. Because the words tell the story of what Jesus has done for us. And appreciating the purpose in our singing to uh, praise God and to teach others, to uplift ourselves, because you know why? We're going to heaven. Amen. In 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 15, Paul says there, What is the conclusion then? I will pray with the Spirit, I will also pray with the understanding. I will sing with the Spirit. Notice that's a little S. I will sing with the Spirit in my heart. And I've seen with the understanding also. So number one, sing like you're going to heaven as you worship. Number two, give like you're going to heaven. Cheerfully, liberally, and with purpose. The purpose-driven life. My life has purpose. And my life is designed and identify. I find my identity in Christ Jesus. Amen. And when the Lord calls me to give, I give with a purpose. Knowing, as Phil said this morning, that that purpose is to spread the gospel. And I'm so proud to do that. And I should be happy to do that. Because I know this, this money is going to spread the gospel through, through various things that we do. 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 2 and 3. <laughs> the church at Macedonia. Remember that? That's the example of our giving for a congregation. He said that in, a, even in great trial of affliction... In the abundance of their joy and their deep poverty abounded in the riches of their liberality. For I bear witness that according to their ability, yes, and beyond their ability, they were freely willing. Freely willing to do what? To give of their means. It was a sacrifice to them because they gave beyond what they had the ability to give. They had purpose. They were cheerful and liberal in their giving. <clears throat> Number three, let us pray like we're going to heaven. From the heart, personal. Let's get down and pray and talk to our Father like He is our Father. With faith, nothing doubting. The Lord is going to answer your prayer. We talked a lot about that recently. Is the Lord answering my prayer? He is going to answer it. Yes, indeed, He's going to answer it. One way or the other, He knows what's best for us. He's going to answer the prayer that is best for us and according to His will. Let's not doubt that. Let's pray from the heart. Let's pour our hearts out in prayer to our Father. In James chapter 1, verse 6, But let a man ask in faith with no doubting. For he who doubts is like the wind of the sea, driven and tossed. Well, is the Lord going to answer my prayer or not? Well, this and that. You know, it, I, I, I don't think he's answering my He's answering your prayer. He's answering first according to his will. And secondly, he's going to answer it best for us. Mm -hmm. In Mark chapter 11, verse 24. Therefore I say to you, Jesus says, whatever things you ask when you pray, believe that you receive them and you will have them. When I pray to God, I need to make sure that my heart says this. I'm going to ask you this, Lord, and I know I'm going to put it out there, and if it's your will, I'm going to get it. It's going to come true. It's going to happen. Amen. And if it's not your will, it's not going to happen. But let me rest assured, whatever it happens is going to be what's best for me. Yeah. And so I can rest assured that he's going to answer my <laughs> prayer to, according to his will and what's best for me. <laughs> Number four, let's study like we're going to heaven. Study with all your might. I think we we let this one down a little bit because I, I think, you know, in school, school will ruin this. <laughs> and I'm a teacher. School will ruin this because we don't like homework. We don't like to study. It's almost like, you know, a curse word. Study. Oh, 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 don't say that to me. Study. But what are we studying? We're studying about our God. We're studying about our destiny. We're studying about how God wants us to live. So let's study with all of our might. And that's what Paul, Paul, who lived his life like he was going to heaven, said in 2 Timothy 2.15, Be diligent, or the King James Version says, 
Study. Another version says, make every effort to present yourself to prove to God a worker who does not need to be ashamed, rightly dividing or handling correctly, or being familiar and knowing the Word of God. Amen. The last thing I want to do on the Day of Judgment is stand before God and not know His will. Amen. You talk about being ashamed. That is shame. Mm -hmm. And we're going to be standing before God. I don't want to be there. Paul doesn't want us to be there either. And so he says, make every effort to study and know God's will so we don't have to be ashamed. Be fruitful in your knowledge of the Word. Peter says... For if these things are yours and abound, and abound, talking about the uh, graces, Christian graces there, you will neither be barren nor unfruitful in your knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. Are you fruitful in the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ? Are you fruitful? <coughs> are you bearing fruit? Is that fruit coming out in your life? Is it changing your life, producing fruit? I think that's what he's talking about here. It's going to bear fruit. The more knowledge we have, the more it's going to bear fruit, and the more we're going to bear more fruit and more fruit for the Lord. Amen. Okay, we're going to heaven, so let's live like it. Let's tell others about Jesus like we're going to heaven. Listen to the words of Paul. This same Paul who suffered for the cause of Christ, suffered terribly probably more than any of us will ever suffer, he says in Galatians chapter 6, verse 14, But God forbid that I should boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom the, by whom the world has been crucified to me, and I to the world. Paul wasn't going to boast about his previous life, how high he ranked up in, in Hebrewism and Judaism, what kind of Pharisee he was. He wasn't going to boast in that, Unless the boasting in that brought him around to boasting in Christ that he gave it all up for Christ. Amen. That's how he boasted. You go back and read Philippians chapter 2 and 3. That's what he's doing there. He's boasting about Christ. He gave all of that up for Christ. Amen. Listen to the words of Peter also. In 1 Peter 4 verse 11. If anyone speaks, let him speak as the oracles of God. If we're, now, that doesn't mean we quote Scripture all the time. What that means is our influence, our, our words need to be influenced by God's Word. So all the words coming out of our mouth, God is pleased with. Amen. In 1 Peter 3.15, But sanctify, set apart the Lord God in your hearts. What does that mean? That means I'm going to give my heart to the Lord. And in doing that, I'm going to know His Word. Here, now let's finish it. And always be ready to give a defense to everyone who asks you a reason for the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. How do we do that? By knowing God's Word and, know, and boasting about our Lord and what the Lord has done for us. So let's boast or let's, let's talk like we're going to heaven. Number three, let's work like we're going to heaven. That doesn't mean working at McDonald's flipping hamburgers or working out on the railroad or anything else. That means working in the body of Christ. Working to build up the body. Build Amen. up the Lord's church. That's what he's talking about there. Titus chapter 3 and verse 8. Titus, or Paul tells Titus, this same Paul who was living like he was going to heaven because he knew he was, this is a faithful saying, and these things I want you to affirm constantly that those who have believed in God should be careful to maintain good works. Are you careful about maintaining good works? Are you involved in good works? Be careful that you do that. Make sure you do that. And he says, be involved in those good works. These things are good and profitable to men. Why is it so profitable to be involved in good works? Because it gives us, I don't want to cheapen the word here, here the idea. It gives us buy-in. We invest something in the body of Christ. When we work in the body of Christ. We put some skin into it. Amen. We put some sweat and blood into it. Amen. That's why it's a good thing. And it makes us stronger. It gives us a purpose. If you have, are not involved in good works, you have really no purpose. Mm -hmm. You're just there. Be involved in good works. 
He goes on to say in verse 14, And let our people also learn to maintain good works, to meet urgent needs, that they may not be unfruitful. And I can say about this congregation, <coughs> that when it comes to doing good works, we do a lot of good works. Amen. And when the call is put out to be involved, to help the needy, to do whatever, everybody shows up. Amen. Almost everybody. And that's what that servant shirt was about. To give them something. I have buy-in. I got involved. I helped somebody this year. Because a servant I will be in 2023. I committed to that in January. We're going to talk about that more next week. You know what? We need to be like our Savior, Master, Jesus Christ. Here's what the book of Acts says about him. Luke. He said, God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power. And this Jesus, who lived like he was going back to heaven was involved in good works. Who went about doing good works. Wouldn't that be great if on our memorial when we're laid out there and people are coming to pay their respects they can say about us that person was involved in good works. I remember that because all the things they did, they worked for the Lord while they were here. That's a great epitaph to put on your gravestones. They worked for the Lord while they were here. I saw one gravestone, I heard about a gravestone, I didn't see it, but I read about it. All, all this person, they really loved bowling. And all they could do, you know, bowling with a ball. That's all they did. Their life was bowling. And so when they died, you know what the words on their gravestone were? Bob loved to bowl. Wow. Bob loved to bowl. I don't want that on my grace, though. I want something good about the Lord. Because I want, even in death, the last words of my grace, though, says, He was a servant of the Lord. He served the Lord. He worked for the Lord. Now, I'm a good bowler. You see what I mean? Work like you're going to heaven. And then, let's be blameless like we're going to heaven. Oh, that word blameless throws a lot of people off. What does that mean? Blameless. I can't be without sin. I can't. I'm going to sin. God knows that. That's why He provided a way of salvation and a continued way of salvation after I'm baptized through Jesus Christ whose blood continually washes me of my sins. 1 John 1, 7 through 10. If I confess and repent of those sins. The blood of Jesus follows me and cleanses me. But what this blameless means is let's live our lives so that no one can say, oh, that person, I know that person over there. And, whoop, 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 and they rattle off all these sins they're known for. That's like being a bowler. You know, known for bowling. Is that all you're known for? Is that all you're known for is sinning? I don't want anybody to point the finger and say, yeah, Jim was a really bad sinner. Is that what you, I, you remember me by? Oh, I don't want that. I don't want to be blameless. The only way I can do that is if I'm in Jesus Christ and if I'm living in Christ and following His will. Amen. Blameless means that nobody can attach something to you. 1 Peter 1, 15 and 16, Peter says, and quotes from the Old Testament, but as He who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct. I want to pattern my life after Jesus, after God wants me to live. Amen. That's what I want people to remember me by. And if I do that, doing my best, Really less likely for people to lay blame on me. Blameless. Matthew 5, uh, 14 through 16. Familiar with this. You are the light of the world. The city that is set on a hill cannot be hidden. Nor do they lamp a light and put it under the basket. But on a lampstand, and it gives light to all who are in the house. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. You can't do that if you're living a blame-filled life, a sin-filled life. Let's live like we're going to heaven. Let's live and prepare ourselves for heaven. Let's live like it. I really love this verse in Galatians 2.20. Paul, that same Paul who lived his life like he was going to heaven. He said, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. He, his whole life was different. He lived it for Jesus. And then again, let's be joyful like we're going to heaven. 
Paul writing from a house arrest, in chains, incarcerated by the Romans, lived a joyful life in Christ, even then, because he knew what? He was going to heaven. So nothing affected him. <clears throat> nothing did. Philippians 4 and verse 4, while he's in chains, writes this, Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say, rejoice. Even if you have chains around your wrists or ankles, rejoice. How could he say that? Because he's going to heaven. He's paying the price here, but he's going to heaven. And in 1 Thessalonians 5, 16, very easy, very succinct, rejoice always. Just, just rejoice always. How can you do that? With the mindset that you're going to heaven. Even in times of suffering, Peter says, but rejoice to the extent that you partake of Christ's sufferings, that when his glory is revealed, you may also be glad with exceeding joy. Rejoice, even when you're suffering for Christ. The overall point of this lesson is to live like we're going to heaven, knowing for sure that our calling and election is sure. 2 Peter 1, 10 through 11, Therefore, brethren, be even more diligent to make your call and election sure. Make every effort to do that. For if you do these things, you will never stumble. For so an entrance will be supplied to you abundantly into the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Live like we're going to heaven. Amen. That's from, that's what came to me when I saw Bill Watkins say that about Paul. Man, that's a great attitude to have in life. I'm going to live like I'm going to heaven. The second part of this, Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. David wrote these words with full assurance, almost braggingly, knowing that God was his shepherd. God was watching over him, caring for him. There's no doubt in his mind he was going to spend eternity with God. Where is God? In heaven. We too can have that blessed assurance. Jesus is mine. That's why Tim led that. Thank you, Tim. We can have that blessed assurance of our eternal life in heaven as long as the Lord is our shepherd. And we're listening and following our shepherd. So let us live like let us live our life with this full assurance of salvation. And let it flow out from us. <laughs> in our daily lives. Now here's where rubber meets the road. Let it flow out from us. This surely goodness and mercy shall follow me. I'm living like I'm going to heaven. I just did that on the spur of the moment. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like a new song. Okay. Now here's a question. Should this mercy, goodness and mercy stop with me? Should it stop with me? I'm feeling it. But should I stop it there? No. Or should I pass it on to others that I have contact with? Amen. The positive aspects of the Lord's goodness and mercy towards me should follow in my footsteps. I should leave a legacy of goodness and mercy that has followed me and flowed from me to others in my life. That's the kind of legacy I want to have, Amen. that I want to leave. I read a really neat story in the book of Philip Keller, uh, A Shepherd's Look at the 23rd Psalm, in the very last chapter, I think it was, Philip Keller tells of two men who stayed a few days with him and his wife while they were on a trip. And before continuing on on their trip, they stayed there a few days, and then they left, and Philip went with them. So it got down the road quite a ways, and one of the men remembered, oh man, he couldn't find his hat. Oh, I think I left it at your house, Philip. Can you call your wife and see if I left my hat at your house? So he called his wife up on the phone. He said, honey, you know, brother so-and-so here, he left his hat there at the house, he thinks. Can you look for it? And so he gave her a few hours and called her back. Did you find the hat? She said, I have scouted. And this is her, her response. I have combed the house from top to bottom. And I can find no trace of the hat. The only thing that this man left behind was a great blessing. Wow. Wow. That's better than a hat, isn't it? Amen. 
He left behind a great blessing. He left an impression in her mind. Do you leave behind <clears throat> blessings for others shared from the goodness and mercy of following Jesus? Do we leave that behind? Do I leave behind peace in lives? Or do I leave behind turmoil? Do I leave behind forgiveness? Or do I leave behind bitterness? Do I leave behind contentment? Or do I leave behind conflict? Do I leave behind the fragrance of joy? Or do I leave behind the fragrance of frustration? Do I leave behind love? Or do I leave behind hate? Faithful Christian life, one that is being blessed by God, should be a conduit of sorts. For the blessings of God being passed through us and flowing on to others. Amen. That's what our lives need to be. In the process of doing that, God is glorified. Amen. Amen. And it's easier to do that, and only possible really to do that, if we live our lives like we're going to heaven because we're God's people. Amen. So in conclusion, what a wonderful thought to ponder this. God has made it possible through Jesus to go to heaven and be with Him for eternity. What's even a better thought is that to realize that we are going to heaven. We are. And that thought should change our attitude in this life. That reality should be reflected in everything we do in this life. And sometimes it's hard to do because problems and Trials, tests come our way. But let us keep in our mind, I don't have to worry about this and let this get me down or check my attitude. Because I'm going to heaven. I belong to God. And so what do I have to be sad about? What do I have to be down in the mouth about? What do I have to question God? Why is this happening to me, God? I don't have to worry about that. Why am I incarcerated in these chains? Even though I may have done something that I'm incarcerated in these chains, that can be forgiven of. And we can rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. Amen. So today, is that thought forefront in your mind? I'm going to try to make it more in the forefront of my mind so that I can share the goodness and mercy that the Lord has blessed me with in this life. I'm going to try to push that thought as far as I can to the front. So that's what I'm thinking about more than other things. Or is that thought foreign in your mind? Completely foreign. You know what? If we're living our lives for the Lord, if we belong to Jesus, we can live our lives that way like we're going to heaven with that knowledge. We are surely going to heaven. Amen. Because the Lord tells me in His Word that that's where I'm going and I believe it. And to do that, we need to obey the gospel. We can't have that thought if we don't obey the gospel, if we're outside the body of Christ. There is zero, not a nil, chance of going to heaven if we're not following the Lord's will and have baptized and have obeyed the gospel of Christ and been baptized. If you haven't been baptized, you need to believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, repent of your sins. Confess that he's the Son of God and be baptized and have all your sins washed away. And then you can come out up out of that water rejoicing, saying these words. I'm going to live my life like I'm going to heaven because I am. Amen. I'm going to live my life that way. Doesn't that sound good? You need to respond to the Lord's invitation. We encourage you to do that at your soonest availability. Think about that. If you're a member of the body of Christ, Things have gotten in your way and that mind, that thought has kind of been pushed to the back. We all had it at one time, didn't we? Sometimes life's problems can push those thoughts to the back. Let's get it back up there in front and realize the Lord doesn't want us to live down in the mouth, ugly lives. He wants us to live for Him the joyful Christian life. Amen. So if you haven't been living a Christian life, then repent, come home to the Lord, ask for a new heart. A new purpose in life to live for Him. If you need to respond to the Lord's invitation, we're going to sing with a song of encouragement right now. We encourage you. I know it's a little different, but you can still come forward and sit in one of the empty chairs up here. We'll listen to you and pray for you. So if you need to respond, please do so right now while we stand.